it's clear that the terms of the Minsk Agreement, to which many did ceasefire, is not working. What should be the next step for the Ukrainian government and Europe, for that matter? Is there a plan B? I don't think there is a plan B. Um, I mean, the Germans um, who were leading much of this were heavily saying things like um, Mariupol is a tripwire, but if the Russians come in in big way to try and create this so-called land corridor from uh, the Russian border to Odessa, then this will be the tripwire where we will no longer oppose the sending of weapons to Ukraine and then there will be tougher sanctions. So I'm, I'm not sure that there is a plan B because I don't think, though the Germans were threatening that, I don't think that they want to go down that, that road. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I, that's why it always seems to the Ukrainians and to me that the, the Europeans in particular are desperate to get the Ukrainians to sign up to Minsk. Mm -hmm. um, and what's um, rather strange is that nobody else is at these um, talks besides the French and Germans. Why are the British not there? Why are the Americans or Canadians not there? Um, I, I, I think it's, it was, what is it? I don't think it's the Ukrainians who decide this, but it was a mistake to have only the French and Germans. French are really not involved, it's the Germans leading this. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure there is a plan B. I, I think that um, many uh, countries are waiting to see what Putin's actions are going to be. Conflict is unresolved. Um, is Putin going to try to in, in, intervene in a, more, in a bigger way um, and to try and um, destabilize the situation? Um, so, but um, the key, the key, the key area is going to be, as I say, um, because it's good, the U.S. is the most important country in NATO. It's going to be the next U.S. president, and in January two thousand and seventeen, they're going to have a new U.S. president. And both houses of the U.S. Congress um, are strongly supportive, and both American political parties are strongly supportive of giving Ukraine far more military support. Um, by the way, that kind of level of support in the U.S. Congress has not been seen in the Canadian Parliament. I don't know why that is. Um, it maybe will change the new Liberal government. Um, but so I, I think there's probably not a Plan B. There's maybe a Plan A two. Um, and um, and that really a lot of that depends on you know what what Putin decides to do, what happens with Syria, and what happens with more terrorist attacks in Europe, and and, and where where the U.S. is going on this. So Canada has always been a close partner to Ukraine. Do you see Canada taking an increased role in the region anytime soon, given the government? Uh, I'm not so sure. sure. Um, the um, Canada has been active in, in a more quieter way than the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is quite um, open and, and, and quite good at PRing, mm -hmm. the sending of its um, various types of military equipment and training programs with the police and elsewhere. The Canadian uh, ambassador to Ukraine is far less publicly um, prominent than the U.S. ambassador. Um, I mean, the, Canada's not going to be a big supporter um, on, on the military side, I don't think, because Canada doesn't spend much on its own military, and, um, but it will continue its training, helping to train Ukrainian forces. Um, it will continue to give Ukraine diplomatic support. But the, the big difficulty for Prime Minister Trudeau is going to be currently Prime Minister Harper and previously, and Prime Minister Trudeau to now, were able to, in some ways, hide behind the coattails of President Obama when he doesn't support sending a military equipment to Ukraine. They can say, well, he's not doing it, so we don't need to do it. But what happens when the Americans decide to do it? Um, I mean, there are a lot of Ukrainians here who were disillusioned with Prime Minister Harper and now um, have hopes pinned on Prime Minister Trudeau. I mean, it, it, I think this is a difficult area. I mean, Canada um, is, uh, uh, spends, it's, what, it's in the bottom six of NATO's 28 members in terms of its military spending. Um, it doesn't need to because it lives in a very secure neighborhood. I mean, and, you know, if there are little green men arriving in the Arctic, I'm sure the U.S. will come to help. Um, so, um, so I don't think it's going to be so much in that area. It's going to be more in terms of technical assistance, uh, military training, uh, diplomatic support in these, these areas. But, um, but 
I, I think one proposal that could be put forward um, certainly would be for um, Canada to be an extra country involved in the Minsk negotiations. Um, I don't think it should be left, and I'm sure the Ukrainians would agree with this, be left surely to the French and Germans. The French now have a lot on their plate. Perhaps the French could withdraw and let the Canadians come in. I mean, there's a close relationship between Canada and France as well. Um, I mean, a second area that could um, could be developed is um, greater lobbying inside the Canadian Parliament, in both houses of the Canadian Parliament. Um, it's been quite behind in terms of the activity in the U.S. Congress. Um, both houses of the U.S. Congress, both U.S. political parties have been very active in lobbying and uh, passing resolutions, passing the Ukraine Freedom Support Act, um, and some of that could now be done um, with the new members of parliament um, in, in Toronto, in Ottawa. There are two, um, two, if I'm not mistaken, maybe more, but two members of the cabinet of the Ukrainian background. As you mentioned, one of the main issues in fighting Russia's influence in the region is the extensive disinformation campaign. Can you speak more on that and what you saw there? Do people in the region believe it? You know, I think the people who believe it in the region are similar to the people who believe it in the West. I mean, it's a kind of propaganda that preaches to the converted. Um, I, um, I don't get a feeling in the West that Russia today um, influences huge numbers of people. If you're, if you're already anti-American, if you're already anti-NATO, then you're going to believe this propaganda. I mean, it might influence a few people on the, on the margins, it, you know, it, it loves conspiracy theories um, and this, that and the other, um, but I don't think it's going to have huge influence in the, I mean, to the extent of, for example, the BBC or, or CNN International, for example. Um, I just don't think it's going to do that. Um, so a lot of the money that Putin throws in this so-called information war is actually a waste of money. Um, and uh, people see it for what it is, pro basically propaganda. They all, you know, Russia's purpose in creating Russia Today was to try and create a Russian CNN. And they haven't done that. I mean, come on. Yeah. And then nobody sees it as a, some kind of objective um, TV show. Um, and um, so I don't think that so much is the case. In the region, in eastern Ukraine, I think if you live in the separatist-controlled areas, then... Um, some of those, many of those, it's difficult to know, um, are going to be those kind of people who um, are already preaching to the converted. You know, they're already, they already believe the, the mythology that's propagated by Russia, that this was a fascist coup financed by the West, the West is out to get us. But you know, these are people who are already, um, they have an identity which is looking to the past, not to the future. I mean, I think a good way of, of um, differentiating these two groups of people is if you have, um, particularly if you're of a socio-economic class which is lower, I mean if you're working class, um, you don't have much education, or if you're a pensioner, um, you're, you know, you're kind of worried about the factory job, you're worried that where's this product going to go if it's not going to Russia, um, you're nostalgic for the past, for the Soviet Union, then you're going to believe this propaganda, and, and you're, going to, you're going to be looking east for your salvation as opposed to looking west. If you're more educated, if you're middle class, if you're, um, you know, if you want your kids as a parent to live in a country which looks like I don't know, Germany or, or even Italy, my mother's Italian, that's fine, um, um, you know, um, Spain or somewhere, somewhere where there's some kind of rule of law, different in Italy to, to Britain, but still rule of law, um, where there's some free media, where there's kind of prospects then you're going to be looking westwards and you're not going to believe that propaganda. So, I mean, it, it really depends on, 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 I think, who you are, how you, how you respond to that. And um, it's, it's, the identity question isn't, isn't based really on what language you speak there. It's based on where you are looking. Are you looking to the past or are you looking to the future? And if you're looking to the future, you're looking westwards. Um, if you're looking to the past, if you're nostalgic, uh, if you believe that the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, is the place for Russia to be and for Ukraine to be, um, if you know where where Ukraine's kind of kind of should be in sort of the modern equivalent of what the Soviet Union used to be like, which is the Russian world, CIS, etc., then you're going to be more nostalgic and you believe the propaganda on, on, 
on the TV. I mean, where I travel to... How are the anti-separatist soldiers holding up in Ukraine? Would you say they're being successful? Or they... Well, they, yes. I mean, I think the Ukrainian forces are... Um, I mean, they, it, you know, it's changed a lot in the last um, 18 months because um, back in the spring of 2014, there wasn't really much of a Ukrainian army. Um, and um, it had to be built up from scratch, um, and you had a lot of uh, um, volunteers rush to to fight, um, including uh, people who were on the Euromaidan, nationalist volunteers. Um, so that's all changed because all of the volunteer battalions, and there was anything up to 40 of them, um, have been incorporated into either the military or the National Guard today. There are no really no kind of autonomous uh, vo volunteer battalions anymore. But but that showed a massive surge in patriotism because these were funded primarily by people, not by the government. Um, so um, can you imagine a situation if, for example, I don't know, um, Canada was invaded by somebody and there was no real military so people rushed to, to become volunteers and they had to spend the Canadian equivalent of what they spend in Ukraine. In Ukraine they were spending two and a half thousand dollars to equip themselves. Equivalent here would be probably 15,000, if you look at the disparity in salaries. And people were doing that. They were borrowing, they were from friends, friends were helping to collect money and such like. And um, so that, that kind of era is over. I mean, um, um, because those uh, volunteers and others have been in incorporated. Um, so I think they're doing quite well. They're better equipped than they were. I mean, if, if they were able to hold back Putin last year, and we're on the verge of defeating the separatists in August until Russia invaded, then I think Putin would have a bigger problem in trying to defeat the Ukrainian forces today. Um, because they're bigger, they're leaner and meaner, as it were, and then they were a year ago. But, and then I think the training's improved with Western backing as well. Um, so it, I, I think a lot of that has, has changed in favor of the Ukrainians. Now the Ukrainians are get troops just like troops everywhere were going to get frustrated by their inability to get an order from Kiev to fire back when they're fired upon. But that's going to be true of soldiers everywhere, right? Given these strong ties to the Soviet period in Ukraine, is the state of Russian nationalism strong among this people? Yeah. Well, in the separatist region, the irony was was that mm -hmm. in, these, in this region of the Donbass and Crimea, there was no Russian nationalism prior to this crisis. Um, and it was it was a it was a Soviet kind of identity in the Donbass and Crimea, and because in the Soviet Union, um, Soviet and Russian identity was intertwined. There wasn't a kind of separate two separate identities. In Moscow, there was really just one identity, which was all mixed together. Um, so their identity was more Soviet, um, and uh, the the new in, new influx of Russian nationalism came from Russia. And this is a nationalism which is um, anti-Western, xenophobic, pro-Stalin, you know, uh, very closely tied to the Russian Orthodox Church, which is itself as xenophobic and anti-Western. Um, it's very hostile to other religions. When we went to Slavyansk, we talked to the Protestant churches there, which had um, lived under the separatist control um, for a few months before the Ukrainians retook back the region. And they were they were targeted as American spies, the Protestants, and they were a lot of them were massacred. So that um, that kind of identity of, of uh, Stalinist, uh, anti-Western, uh, imperial Russian nationalism, um, Soviet nationalism has been artificially imported, I would say, um, and. It's going to have an imprint on, on the local population in those separatist controlled areas, which will make it difficult for them to be reintegrated into Ukraine. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, um, but, it but it's something that Putin's allowed it to emerge inside Russia itself. And, you know, the people who came to support the separatists were allowed in by Russian intelligence. I mean, they control the border, they allowed them in, and they allowed to train and recruit. So um, you have the irony, the biggest irony, is Russian fascists coming to the, to the Donbass to fight so-called Ukrainian fascists.